I've always been fascinated by the process of discovery. What happens in that moment when an inventor or a discoverer makes that leap, that leap to an idea, a new idea? Is it just luck? Is it just genius that inspires them in that moment? This has always been a part of my interest in the history of science. In 1905, an obscure patent clerk from a small European country came up with a theory, an idea that was to revolutionize our understanding of space and time. This is, of course, Albert Einstein, and this was his theory of special relativity. His his idea solved some of the biggest problems that had plagued uh, physics, electricity, magnetism for several decades at the end of the 19th century. Yet his ideas came from such an obscure quarter that very few people actually paid any attention to them for quite a while. Now, the question is, why was it this guy here? Why was it Einstein that made these discoveries? Why a patent clerk from Switzerland? And our usual, the usual story that people imagine is that this was just something like luck, right? That Einstein was a genius, that he, was in the, he had the right brain, and he was in the right time and the right place, um, and that this is what allowed him to achieve what he did. I think if we think about that, a little bit more carefully, we'll find that that's not a very satisfying explanation. It doesn't really tell us very much about why Einstein, right? Why this particular guy here? What, what is it about him? I want to offer you a different explanation which pays a lot more attention to social and political context. Now, to do this, um, what what we need to do is actually learn, know a little bit about Europe in the late 19th century and early 20th century. At this time, um, the problem of coordination of clocks was a central issue in Europe. Uh, I, on my slide, if I could move it forward, uh, here we go. You can see this is the clock tower in Geneva. Uh, in the late 19th century. And you can see something quite odd about this if you look at it. There are actually three clocks in the middle of the tower here. Now, why would this be the case? It turns out that in the late 19th century, different European cities had different times. So if it was noon in Paris, it might have been 11.45 in Nice, 12.07 in Strasbourg, 1.45 in Berlin, Different cities had different times. And not only was this just a nuisance, it was particularly a nuisance if you wanted to travel around. And people were increasingly traveling around by train. And uh, what was occurring was not only was this difficult to make the trains run on a reasonable schedule, but trains were actually colliding into one another because of the difficulties of basically coordinating clocks across different cities. So people had various ideas for how to fix this problem. A lot of them involved electrical and mechanical systems that would basically send signals from city to city across Europe in order to coordinate clocks. And as you probably know, Switzerland still is a center of horology, of clock making, of clockworks. It's famous for its watches and clocks. And so it was one of the centers of this kind of activity, of clock coordination. And in fact, uh, this put Einstein in the patent office right at the center of this problem, of the problem of coordinating clocks across Europe. These kinds of ideas were coming across his desk all the time. And in fact, his father and his uncle had had uh, an electromechanical company that actually made some of these time coordination uh, devices. Now, <clears throat> what's so significant about this? In fact, it turns out that this, so here's an example of the kind of scheme that people came up with, and if we just go forward once more here, this actually, this problem of time coordination actually led Einstein to one of the direct uh, immediate ideas that was to lead to his special theory of relativity. And this is the problem of simultaneity. 
And this is the problem of how do you know whether two events occur simultaneously? And Einstein had a thought experiment, which he did, which is sort of roughly illustrated here, which was that basically the idea is if you stand in the middle of two events, they both send a light signal to you. If you're in the, if you're in the middle and they send a light signal at the same time, you're going to receive it at the same time, and therefore you're going to judge those two events to be simultaneous. If you're, for example, this silly person here standing on top of a car that's moving, you'll receive one of these light signals before the other and actually then judge the events one, two, to be not simultaneous. And so this was exactly analogous to the kind of coordination problem, time coordination problem, that Europe was facing in the late 19th century. And it was also the solution that led Einstein directly to his special theory of relativity. So I think rather than attributing what Einstein did purely to luck, the more attention we pay to the particular circumstances, social and political circumstances, at the time he was being trained and the time he was working, the more this starts to seem like something that we can actually explain with these kinds of factors. My second, ah, there we go. My second example is similar. It's taken from a similar time period. This is Henri Becquerel, uh, the discoverer of radioactivity. Uh, unlike Einstein, Henri Becquerel was uh, a leading scientist in the late 19th century. He was well known. He was a professor at the Museum of Natural History in Paris. He was a leading member of the Parisian Académie des Sciences. And uh, he, this, his discovery of radiation is often taken to be a, an example of serendipity in science. We now basically this, think of radiation in this way. A heavy atom like uranium splits apart into two smaller atoms and gives off some energy. But in fact, uh, nothing about this kind of, uh, nothing about this was known in the last decade of the 19th century. And in, and in fact, people thought that atoms could not break apart, that it was impossible for them to break apart. What had been discovered, however, were X-rays. X-rays had recently been discovered by Will William Röntgen, and Röntgen had found that he'd taken a cathode ray tube, which is something that's in the back of an old television. It's basically like a beam of electrons. And when you shine it on a piece of glass, like in the front of an old television screen, it actually glows. It makes a phosphorescent glow. And what was discovered was that this glow was not only giving off light, but it was giving off these other mysterious rays called X-rays, which came to be called X-rays. Now, what several people in and around Paris imagined was that perhaps other phosphorescent and fluorescent substances were also giving off X-rays. So there are various minerals that exist just naturally that also phosphoresce and fluoresce when they're exposed to light. So people wanted to test this hypothesis. Were there X-rays coming out of these uh, minerals? And how they did this was they got a piece of photographic film, basically, early photographic film. And when this film was exposed to X-rays, it left these kind of characteristic dark splotches on the X-ray film. Now, the problem with doing an experiment like this was that, as we know, film is also, film is also exposed by light. Light, if light hits the film, it will also cause black or dark splotches. So the experimental setup that was used by Becquerel and by others was to take the film, here uh, I have it represented just by these blue bars, and wrap it in some black paper so that it, wasn't, it couldn't be developed by light. And then to take the fluorescent mineral, here he was using uranium salt, to expose it to sunlight to stimulate, to stimulate the fluorescence, and then to observe, to develop the photographic plate to see if there were these black splotches uh, that were there. And the idea was that there would be black splotches because there were supposedly x-rays uh, coming out of these minerals. Now, chance is supposed to have entered for Becquerel in two ways here. First of all, that he was using uranium salts, right? This 
is perhaps a coincidence, you might think. Second of all, on the day that he went to do these experiments, he prepared everything, his salts, his photographic plate wrapped in black paper, and it was Paris in February, and it was overcast for several days. And so there was no sunlight to illuminate his mineral. Uh, and so he said, all right, I'll delay my experiment, and he put it away in a drawer for several days, just away from the light in a drawer. And then, uh, eventually, he took it out of the drawer, developed his film, and found, in fact, that there were these black splotches. And he knew right away that there was something very weird about this. Right? These hadn't been exposed to light, so you couldn't attribute it to phosphorescence or fluorescence in the usual way, so something else weird was going on. And this is usually give, taken to be the discovery of radiation. Right? Now, I want to suggest that this um, is not uh, quite as lucky as it might seem. First of all, Becquerel knew that there was something special about uranium. He was a world expert on fluorescent and phosphorescent minerals. His father, who had also worked at the Museum of Natural History in Paris, had collected one of the largest collections in the world of these kinds uh, of minerals and had them for Becquerel to work with. Becquerel knew that there was something weird about uranium. He might have no, not known what it was, but he had the kind of an intuition that there was something interesting going on with uranium. Second of all, it wasn't just luck that caused him to develop the photographic plates, even though they'd been in a drawer. He had good experimental procedures, and he had perhaps a reason to think that something else weird was going on. His actual methodology led him to develop plates which he wouldn't have expected, develop films which he may not have expected to have uh, actually any splotches on them. But even more than this kind of, even more than this sort of, this, these factors, I think that it's fair to say that radiation, to call just those incidents Becquerel putting away his experiment in the drawer, the discovery of radiation, is actually misunderstanding the process of discovery. Becquerel did not think that these splotches were due to the disintegration of the uranium atoms. He didn't know that, and for many years afterwards, he maintained that it was due to something he called metallic phosphorescence, something we do not now think exists, right? something he, he made up. It wasn't until further work by people like Marie Curie and then eventually Ernest Rutherford and Frederick Soddy at McGill in Canada who eventually showed that these, these splotches were due to the energy released by the breakdown of uranium and other atoms. And so actually the discovery of uranium, or the discovery of radiation rather, was not this chance event that happened in Becquerel's lab, but something that we should really think about as spread over quite a significant period of time, about seven years between 1896 and 1903. And, the, and thinking about discovery in this way suggests that the role of chance is much, much less. My final example is quite different. It's taken from a more modern period, and it has more to do with biology. But this is also something that's often attributed to luck. This is the discovery of Viagra, the treatment for erectile dysfunction. Now, the usual story is that the drug company, Pfizer, was testing uh, a drug for a kind of heart disease, something called angina pectoris. And they had a large clinical trial going, a large study to test the efficacy of this drug. And during that trial, uh, many of the men who were on very high doses of this reported getting better erections. And so Pfizer was immediately able to switch their trial, switch their trial around, and make it a trial to see if this drug was, could cure erectile dysfunction. So that's the usual story, that this was somehow a chance discovery, right? But I want to suggest, again, a longer story that, has, that suggests that this is more to do with the social context that was actually prevalent in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Why was Pfizer able to take advantage of this so quickly? Why were they able to come up with this new drug so quickly and convert it into clinical trials? Well, it turns out there was already a theory of how 
uh, basically the biochemistry of erections. And here you can see uh, sildenafil is in the middle there, is basically Viagra, and this whole theory already existed. Um, Pfizer was able to capitalize on this theory and immediately insert their drug into this uh, knowledge. And the reason why this theory existed was part of a longer process of how people thought about impotence and how people thought about disease in the 20th century. Before the 1960s and 70s, people believed that, that uh, impotence was due to aging, there was nothing you could do about it. By the 1960s and 70s, psychologists uh, basically adopted impotence and said this is a psychological blockage that can be cured through treatment. But in the, by the 1980s, people, especially urologists, came up with the idea that this was actually something that was located in particular organs and that it was a molecular problem that could have a molecular solution. So there was already this idea that was present in, uh, the, in the sort of world of medicine. And, and Pfizer was not just lucky to discover this drug, but actually uh, able to take advantage of this already existing knowledge. So what should we learn from these three examples? I think the idea that discoveries are just lucky suggests that they could fall at any time from kind of out of the bright blue sky. But I think these examples suggest exactly that uh, discoveries are suited to the time and places that they occur. They occur right when we might need them or expect them. So I think for all of us, and for historians in particular, what this means is we should be skeptical of any explanation that just attributes discovery to chance. We should look harder for the social and political explanations. And for scientists, I think it means that we need to be attuned to the so social and political circumstances in which, we, in which we are working. Pasteur in the 19th century said, chance favors the prepared mind. And I think that that's right, and that suggests that Good scientists, the best scientists who make discoveries, come up with inventions, not only understand what is going on in the lab, in the worlds of their lab, but also in the world around them. Thank you.